Welcome. This is Laura. I am Laura on the Laura Meek Show. Welcome to the show. Uh, we are coming to you live from my in-home studio here in Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage, by the way, is the playground of the president. Um, Gerald Ford used to live here. Obama is theory. He's going to move in here someday. Uh, so that it's, it's a fun place to be. And it's a little warm. I think we're up in the 104-ish. Uh, today so you can feel the heat when we're, <laughs> when we're working on this they uh, fly high living this is all about finding your dream flying high living adventurously that's that's kind of my tagline and to live that fly high life all you have to do is discover and deliver your special gift to the world that's what we specialize in helping you find your gift and bring it to the world because we really do need all of that um, interesting show today. We, we, so much is going on in the world and, um, Barbara and I had talked some about what we, what, what of the thousand things that we really wanted to focus in on today. And, and today really is, is about being on the threshold of a new adventure. So a lot of stuff is going on, a lot of changes in the world, uh, protests in the street, COVID, which is just I mean, we're um, what, in the fourth month of this excitement. A lot of stuff for any one individual to try to figure out. So rather than just having you figure it out on your own, we brought in a special guest. So today my guest is a returning guest. Now, I always, it's so funny because when we end the show, invariably it was like, oh, and I had so much more to say. And so I invited Barbara back. In the last show we did in April, uh, Barbara, you and I talked about the six mental faculties and uh, paradigms and perspective, I think, are going to be a big part of today's show. Um, and we want to, so kind of my focus today is, is for us to chat about how, how we can take this confusing world and then make some sense out of it and take some steps forward so that we feel a little safer, a little more secure, a little more at peace with what's going on. Now, to get us started, Barbara and I had talked in preparation for the show. We were chatting about something and Barbara, uh, oh, well, and let me say this, I, I missed a piece. So <laughs> let me go back. So Barbara, who is sitting over here, she is the CEO of the Real of Realize Your Vision, which is her coaching platform, which she founded in 2012. She's currently a speaker, a facilitator, a team builder, academic <laughs> instructor, and personal life enhancement coach. Her innovative coaching programs are helping people break through their limitation limitations and achieve greater personal results, which it's very aligned with flying high. So this is all, this is all some people who have spent a lot of time studying and understanding, trying to understand what's going on. As we were talking, so let me go back to that. We were, you and I were talking before, and and one of the things that came up was reference to a song. And so I want you to start there. Tell me why this song came up, and and then I want to talk a little bit about that song because it's really key to the start of our discussion today. Well, uh, relevant to the last few weeks uh, in terms of all the protesting and all of the uh, problems that have come up since our April talk, uh, we're still in a tremendous time of uncertainty. But one of the things that was brought to my attention were the lyrics from a Rodgers and Hammerstein play and movie from the 1950s. Nine. Um, some of us were just really small children. Some of us weren't born yet. But I want to read this, the lyrics of this song to you from South Pacific, which was a play and a, and a movie that was about the islands of the South Pacific and the young 
starring lead, uh, the male starring lead wanted to marry one of the women that had been born on one of the islands there. And this is what the lyrics are. And it's very pertinent of what we're going to be talking about nice. today. You've got to be carefully taught is the name of the song. You've got to be care carefully taught how to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed into your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight. To hate all the people your relatives hate, you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. So Laura and I were talking a lot about that in terms of what kind of perspective we personally can take or adjust to or adopt or reflect on that could give us more of a sense of liberating ourselves from some of the early things that we learned in our upbringing because a lot of the things we learned in our upbringing are what we call truth. And we're gonna to talk today about the uncertainty of truth and how do we judge truth and how what perspectives can we take and as individuals that pertains to what can we do today to rectify things not only in our own country, but globally in our own personal way, in our own personal lives. Yeah, now one of the things that really struck me, and I'm sure it struck you as well, is that was lyrics from the 1950s. And we would, yeah. in so many ways, I think part of the challenge that we're seeing today is, is that that was the 50s, late 60s, early 70s, racial riots, I was, 10, 12 years old then, um, but I was well aware. I mean, I grew up in Minneapolis where George Floyd was and, and the perspective then was there were race riots downtown Minneapolis. They were hosing people and they had dogs. And I mean, it was a, a real, real mess and time of real change. But the funny thing is, is, is that we recognized in the 50s. We recognized in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010. Here we are, 2020. Holy smokes, we're still talking yeah. about this. And that, I think, is so discouraging to so many people who have been through that. Plus, our history, as you and I discussed, Laura, before, our history as a country was really based on the fact that the founding fathers came over from uh, the European countries to really have freedom of religion and freedom to express themselves. But they came over here and what did they do? The first thing is they met with the Native American residents and instead of embracing them, and they were embraced, but instead of embracing them, they started fighting with them over the land and eventually put the Native Americans into reservations, which, right? right. Then after that, we brought slaves over for in different parts of the country. We brought slaves over from Africa and the Caribbean to do all of the work. So we then incarcerated, so to speak, or imprisoned people into an indentured lifestyle. So there was always a sense of white supremacy from the very beginning in this country. So we're really, even though our constitution and our um, declaration of independence are wonderful and say the right things, we actually, from the beginning inception of our own country, had a uh, position of white supremacy in terms of running our country. So it's something we've lived with and have been conditioned to for so many years growing up in the United States. Well, and part of what the song talks about and where I kind of want to grapple with for a second is, is that you have to be taught at six, seven, or eight. Yeah. Hate the people that your parents hate. And it's, it's an interesting experiment, this thing in America that we're doing, because I would agree with you. The overriding values that were laid down in the Constitution, I think, are, are the mag magnet that draws people to America. And I did a video last week talking about our Pledge of Allegiance and the fact that it's liberty and justice wow. for all. Now, the challenge, though, and I think this is part where uh, 
there may be blind spots for, for people when you're raised with a paradigm that, you know, Indians are savages or, uh, you know, uh, African Americans, Africans can be taken as slaves. They don't know anything. So we can, we can take them and make them work on our plantations. The challenge I think is, is, is that that was the paradigm they grew up. That's the operating system that was operating in their mind. So when they got here and said, oh man, these savages are, you know, we've, they don't obviously can't read English. What, what, and they're obviously not sophisticated like we are not realizing that, you know, English is one of many languages and it doesn't necessarily make you the smartest person on the planet, but it's those paradigms. Right. And I, I do think that, that part of what you're saying, so talk to me about paradigms in 2000 to 2020. What are our kids growing up with? What kind of paradigms are those, do you think? Well, I think, uh, you know, it really depends on which part of the country, which part of the world, you know, the children are growing up in. I think uh, growing up uh, in my grandchildren's age group, which is eight, going on eight and uh, 14, uh, you know, even the two of them have a different perspective, I think, because of the uh, when they've been raised. But, you know, they're exposed to so much. <laughs> uh, with, with the media and with social media and with gut being able to do research online and everything, they're exposed to so much more than people even a generation before were. So uh, I don't know what their perspectives are. I just know that teenagers seem to be much more um, outspoken about wanting uh, cohesiveness and understanding and communication, which is really refreshing to me. Yeah. Um, and as a life coach, you know, I really base my whole uh, coaching programs on really expressing yourself and learning how to communicate honestly and really looking at yourself honestly. And I think younger people are more open to that um, and have shed uh, some of the ideas that their parents had had. Of course, in the 60s, you know, people shed the uh, feelings of their parents as well and went in a different direction. So this has been happening for years and years and years all over the world, people shedding the old ways and doing the new. So now actually we're in a great place and our title is we're standing on the threshold of a new adventure. And because of that, we can look at it from the perspective of a new time, if we wish. Uh, if we want to take that position, we can look at it as a time that we can actually make an impact uh, on the lives of others around us if we, if we wish, if we have the desire, and we can actually change our own ways of thinking if we want to take the time and energy to do so, uh, to self-reflect. So I think the young people, you know, the, the generations today um, are a lot more open and more compassionate. And of course, they're more global. So they understand that other cultures have realities too and have truth in their belief systems. Yeah, well, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree that there are some real pluses and I think some other challenges that we're facing because no, no matter how far you go back in history, there's plus and minus of being in, in every age. And I agree that the, the youth today, our kids are exposed to vastly more possibilities. The, the part of the flip side of that, and the thing that I kind of work on in, the, in my coaching world is not with all of the choices comes the choice to focus. Yes. And, Unlike in, in our era where we grew up and there were three news stations and they kind of gave you a balance, as best they could, a balanced version of what was going on. You know, Chet Huntley and all those guys, you know, they, we always respected those guys because they really didn't ever stop and say, this is how it is, or this is my opinion. They just kind of tried to tell you the news. My, my challenge now is, is, is that with all this, choice comes the choice to just focus on people who believe what you believe right 
and 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 I, and I want to uh, let's I want to circle back for a second about the idea of rebelling against your parents. Can I assume that you had some phase where you just your parents just did not understand what it was like to be <laughs> you. And I'm, I, and I, you know, that I think for the sixties and seventies, that was a huge shift in the parental paradigm. You know, the earlier fifties version was Ozzie and Harriet and, you know, you respected your parents and yes, sir, no, sir. And, and whatever they did, you did. And you kind of cloned yourself into that. Uh, I know when I grew up, you know, all of a sudden boys had long hair and we were wearing, you know, bell bottom jeans yeah. and, and no one could understand what we were going through. But there was a kind of a definitive, I'm leaving. I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not going to join in on that. And so talk to, talk to me about this because I think within the, within the realm of our audience, people come to hear about possible ways to to change what's going on you know i think i think that's transformation talk radio and everything that we talk about has to do with the fact that you might not be exactly happy where you are and you might want to make a change and so to me a lot of that is first of all noticing the paradigm that you have i i just went through dream builder live a couple of weekends ago had a lot of shifting because all of a sudden smack my paradigms were like smack in my face. It's like, whoa, I didn't real, realize that, that, that was happening. Tell me about paradigms and, and how we can change our paradigms. How can we, how can we break away from this? I'm, I'm Republican. I'm Democrat. I'm, I'm, you know, a Raiders fan. I'm a, you know, how, how do you break out of that? Well, I wish I had a, an answer for that. <laughs> I, uh, the only thing I can say about that or some of the things I can say about that is I can use a story uh, that I tell people. It's a story of a big tree. Let's, let's imagine you're looking out the window at a big tree and it's a beautiful tree. And from our perspective, we see the whole tree. We see all the leaves, we see how big it is and we see the, the, the trunk and the bark on the trunk. But if there's a bird in a nest in the tree, the perspective, and that's the key word here, the perspective or the perception of the tree is just around the nest where the leaves are and where its, its nest is. It flies in and out to its nest and it sees leaves and it sees branches, right? So its perception is of that. And if there's a bark beetle that happens to inhabit the trunk of the tree, its perception of the tree is all about the bark and what is it going to be able to eat in the bark. So there's three perceptions there. And of course, we all as individuals, as humans, we have many different perceptions of what is truth, right? That's the real question here. Yeah. yeah. But if you realize that they're all living in the same tree and we're perceiving the tree. And of course, we could talk about other creatures that could live in a tree too, like ants yeah. and different kinds of creatures that live in trees, fungus, and all kinds of mistletoe, I don't know. Yeah. But our perception is of the whole tree. So depending on what the input is in your life, meaning what you were talking about, Laura, if you're listening to Fox News, you're listening to this, you're watching that, you're getting social media in, input, you're getting, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of input, tremendous amount of input today. And depending on how you sift through that input, one needs to develop a sense of fact or truth. And it's very, very difficult today. And that's why we're in, and just like our last session in April, where we talked about uncertainty, I believe my perspective today is we're still in tremendous uncertainty. How do we cope with COVID now that we've all come back into living somewhat of a sense of normalcy, but it's really not because we still have to be cautious and we're, some people are more cautious than others. And there's the, <laughs> the doers. And the doctors. Tell us that we found that out. There's all sorts of perspectives on everything going on and there always have been, and there probably always will be. But my recommendation is as you, you talk about paradigms, those are really our belief systems that we were, have ingrained in us for over the years and, and our experiences have shaped in us. And if we can take time 
to examine our own belief systems and see whether they're still true for us. Do we still believe the things that we have ingrained in our very cellular structure anymore, or do we want to change those? And if you want to change them, there are ways that you can go about reflecting and allowing yourself to look at different perspectives. One is listening. If we learn to listen to each other more, I'm sure all of us have friends, really close friends that we really like, but that have different political or social points of view. And it's very, very difficult to love them and care for them in the same way when we, are, we have different perspectives of what truth is. But as human beings, we're all different, but we're all really the same. Yeah, and well, we, and... We can look at people like in, in Asia, you know, when they say namaste, if we can look at as in individuals as having the sameness inside of them, they want love, families, a home, uh, financial security, just a sense of belonging. Uh, everybody really wants the same things, no matter what shape their eyes are, what their religion is, what part of the country or world they're from, what the color their skin is. We really all want the same things. If we could learn to respect one another, and if we can work on ourselves personally, which I think we'll get to in the second half more, yeah. right, Laura? If we could really learn to personally take responsibility for our own words and actions more. We might be in a better place with one another. Well, and that perspective is key. You know, I mean, we talked about the fact that, that, you know, when we, the early Americans came over from England or Europe and, and trying to escape this religious background, they felt, well, we want to be free to, to uh, experience religion in the way that any any of us want to and we and we have that but but they also came with a with a paradigm that there is a hierarchy of human beings and that we're on the top and then there the you know the native americans and and the africans they're down here and because of that they crafted up a system that they figured was fine <laughs> this is fine this is this is part of our belief. And it wasn't, it really wasn't until people started thinking, well, I wonder what it would be like to be a slave. It's yeah. like, yeah, that can't be good. I don't think I, I don't think <laughs> I'd want to be a slave. And then you find, you know, so all of a sudden there's a, a smattering of people who had a different perspective, then splits a country into two perspectives. Like this is okay. And this is not okay. But it was through that, that, challenge of that paradigm that that they were actually able to discuss and sadly quite a war over but but I, I guess what I'm getting at is 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 that I think for us right now and, and and let's just talk about the COVID issue and the masks there's yeah. people there's people that think that masks are not needed and there are people that think that masks are needed and part, part of what has to happen is rather than being in a win-lose Super Bowl mentality, like I'm right and you're wrong. That, I, I think there is a paradigm that we have to work on in America of this, I'm right, you're wrong, because there are people that will fight to the death saying that, that this is oppression of the government to make you wear a mask. And the other half is saying, like, I don't want to die of the virus. Could you please wear a mask? And and what's happening is, is each side is like sticking to their guns. Like, this is my firm belief. And somewhere in that, we have to say, let's get curious. I, I like this. This uh, this came up in a, in, a, in a seminar recently. Instead of saying, I'm right or I'm wrong, say, I'm curious as to why you believe that why what about that is that you believe and so that you can have a dialogue because there's there's science that we could talk about there's beliefs you know honestly the people that believe that this is uh government oppression believe that i mean that you know it's just like people believe that africans were fine with being a slave 
they believe well, it. Well, all of it has to do really, really with being empathetic. And uh, you and I were discussing that old saying about you never know what it's like to live someone's life till you walked in their mo moccasins. Moccasins. <laughs> and, you know, it's really true. I mean, unless you've been exposed to someone who's been persecuted, and my family what comes from a, a background of persecution in Nazi Germany, um, and they all escaped, um, some with a lot of bitterness, and others, like my mother, and others in our family who just really worked their, you know, worked their fingers to the nub to be successful and overcame all of that and learned the language and everything. But well, so let me, let me stop you there real quick. We've got yeah. about a minute. We're going to sneak in a break. Okay. Right, we don't make many breaks. So we're going to sneak in a break right here. Okay. Um, real quick. How can they get a hold of you if they want further information, if they got to run to their next event? Okay. It's B Stenning, S T E N N I N G at realize R E A L I Z E U R vision v-i-s-i-o-n dot com or 760-777-0117 sweet okay so that's <laughs> how that's how you can get a hold of her they uh and she has a website and and more information when we come back this is a you know again i love i love this we're on the edge of adventure there's a new world out there and we want to participate in that we're gonna when we come back Barbara and I are going to talk about some of the things that we can specifically do uh, with, within our own personal realm to engage in, and learn about our paradigms and make changes that will help the world get to where we all want to be. And that is love. This is Laura Meeks. You're on The Laura Meeks Show. We're going to be right back. Stick with us. Hey, this is Laura Meeks. Welcome back to The Laura Meeks Show. They, uh, my guest today is Barbara Stenning, uh, coach, teacher, speaker, extraordinaire. Our topic today is, um, are we standing on the threshold of a new adventure? And I really do think that we are on the threshold of a great new adventure. Obviously, dream on, fly high, live adventurously. I think there is adventure out here to be had. But part of what we're chatting about today uh, is the fact that we have paradigms. We have we have an operating system that more often than not is instilled by your parents or your mentors at a very early age. We started with that great song, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught, out of the 1950s, South Pacific, uh, which was very popular, <laughs> a very popular show. But the essence of that song saying is, is that parents teach their kids how to hate, how to hate people with different eyes. It was about South Pacific. So there was a, 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 a stereotype, I guess, of uh, Asians and South Pacific Islanders. And, but the point being is, is that we do learn these things. And then kind of where Barbara and I are talking today is the, fa is the fact that you get to choose whether that operating system that you started with is going to be the one you live with for the rest of your life. And I think in so many ways that that is part of the challenge that's going on, that, that in a lot of ways, we all have the systems that we got at birth. And unless you somewhere stop and ask yourself, you know, if you grew up Catholic and now you're Catholic, you have to ask yourself someday, some way, is this what I believe? If it is, stay with it. If it's not, then you have the opportunity to change. I think that's the adventure uh, that we're talking about. One of the things that, that we're going to start this segment with is George Floyd, eight minutes and 42 seconds, ends his life all over a $20 bill. And the question then becomes, do we have a just system? And it, I think it really, again, goes back to perspective, right, on where, yeah. where you grew up and, and how you were taught as to whether that is a just system. And one of the things, Barbara, that you brought up, you know, Americans came over here and, and took over from the Native Americans, put them all on reservations, brought over slaves, enslaved a bunch of people, 
and that's that was the system that they had and they it's like we're hey this is good this this works for us the white people and so so even now you know that was that song came from the 50s we went through the 60s and the race rides and now we're in 2020 and we're back at it with the challenge that we may not have done as good as we could have in changing that paradigm that the system is just for all. So reflect, reflect on that. Tell me, you and I chat about some of this. Yeah, there's so much to say. I mean, the, the system appears to be broken. I think that what more and more people are seeing, actually around the world, it's not just here. You're seeing, yeah. you're yeah. seeing a lot of racial inequity all over the world and, and uh, hierarchical financial uh, inequity. So uh, I think there's so many systems that are broken and people are willing now to take a look at that and try to mend it. Uh, the question is who's going to mend it and how is it going to be mended? I think we need to have some sort of, uh, on the outside of us, I think we need to have some sort of spiritual recognition of unity to be able to have inspirational spiritual leaders all around the world trying to lift the frequency of thinking to a higher level so that people are not operating out of financial inequity only and uh, seemingly uh, lifestyle inequity, but also the, the bankruptness of our family structure and our spiritual um, energy in, the, in our various cultures. So what you were saying, Laura, about having a choice today, the choice really is one that somewhat, it takes time and it takes energy to change. Most people don't want to change. It's, it's just too much work. It's just too difficult. And they'd have to maybe reassess too many things to change to, to actually be somebody they'd like to be. So some of the exercises I give some of my clients in order to be able to reach down and touch some of those inborn mindsets that they've grown up with is to ask them on your deathbed and you're looking back at your life, who would you, how would you feel what would you feel most proud of in your life that you've become? What would you, uh, what would you like people to be saying about you at your celebration of life? What kind of a human being, in other words, have you become over the duration of your life? Uh, and reflecting on those types of end of life kind of perspectives, which really gives you a whole different feeling than if you're just in your everyday reality of survivalhood and uh, social issues. So even when you're young, you can be looking ahead and saying, you know, not only who do I be, want to become, which is what you and I do a lot of work with people on, but who do you want to become? That's very important. And then are you going to become it? And are you going to be able to take the time to figure out who you are today in order to become who you want to be? So both you and I went through a lot of years of learning how to look at our lives and have the drive and the instinct and the desire to become something else in our life. We made job transitions, you know, work transition, career transitions. And actually it's really up to the individual to be able to impact others in their life because by example is usually how we're judged and not just by our rhetoric. We can say all kinds of things, but the way that we behave speaks so much louder than yelling or screaming or forcing people to be able to believe the way we do. And listening, as I said earlier, is a wonderful thing to try to cultivate in yourself as opposed to constantly talking or thinking ahead. Yeah. Well, and I would say even a lot of people say, well, I heard you. That's vibration on your ears. I heard you, I don't want to believe you. I don't want to think about it. it it's a different thing to listen because lis listening means you're incorporating some of your values and your thoughts into what, what are they saying? Now, one of the things that I think is important is the awareness. You know, we talk about the fact that you have these paradigms. Most people, I think, you know, they, 
they get this, in, you know, <laughs> zero to 10 years. And then they just kind of run the rest of their life with those without ever really stopping to say, wow, you know, what's going on there. But I think part of what made George Floyd so important and the, and the, the current activity in the United States and around the world is, is that that is bringing huge awareness to this. I mean, it's one thing, uh, you know, it's funny when my mom, when we grew up, mom was an executive in an ad agency as a woman and she would come back and say well you know the guys did this and they talked over me and they, you know they wouldn't let me do it and, and we're, we're like you know never seen it never heard of it mom you must be crazy and i think in a lot of ways people say when, when they hear well there's an injustice in our system in our in our prison system in the incarceration in the laws the way that police police there's all these problems and people are like not really i mean you know from my perspective i don't really have very many interactions with the law and they don't count they don't stop me while i'm driving <laughs> you know so so in my in, in, if you just focused on your little reality you would say well that doesn't really exist but then now all of a sudden you've got smack dab in your face on tv this video is showing over and over and over again. It's like, whoa, that wasn't right. Then you're seeing, you know, people protesting in the streets. And then you're seeing, you know, buildings on fire. And then, you know, Zurich and Auckland, New Zealand are in the streets. That You can't not be aware that something's going on. And it would be at that teachable moment that you would say, so what do you think about that? Right. And and what? I and I think that's part of how how this whole thing is evolving. And in, in so many ways, although it is a very confusing time to have COVID and to have these uh, racial protests right now, even though that's really challenging, it is also a huge benefit. It is a time for all of us to stop and say, how, how do I? feel about that how and and is my experience you know it's really hard I, my son sent me a video the other day of a uh black guy that was stopped for going 65 in a 70. <laughs> he's like wow yeah, sure why uh what's why did you pull me over he goes do you know how fast you're going he goes yeah 65 goes exactly that's five miles below the speed limit. Why are you going so slow? What's the matter? What's what's the problem here? He's like, what's the problem? <laughs> I don't see any problem. Well, I'm going to have to write you a ticket for that. It's like, what's the law that I broke? It's like, I'll bring it back. And he comes back and says, well, you got a warning this time. He's like, a warning for what? <laughs> that That's a perspective that... I would never have. I mean, that's not an experience I had. But when well, you, I, I heard something about that. An interesting. Um, uh, I watched the. I think I mentioned you. I watched that Oprah Winfrey special where she yeah. uh, two night special. It was on TV a couple weeks ago on cable, and she had a police chief from uh, somewhere in the south on there as one of the on Zoom. You know, yeah. one of the guests, and he talked about how his life had was bifurcated in that he was a police chief and had been on the force for 30 years as a black policeman. And he had two grown sons then later on in life. And he said he was in the, in the force with his other policemen, you know, every day. And he had one perspective and that he had to go home in clear conscience and explain to his sons that they were probably gonna be pulled over by policemen constantly and this is how they had to behave in order to avoid confrontation and avoid any kind of violence right and he was really torn he loved what he was doing and he loved the force and but as a black man in a powerful position in the police force and also though a father of two black young men he knew his sons would be pulled over just like he was you know as a young man so it's interesting, you know, this whole perspective of how different it would be 
to walk into Trader Joe's in the desert, <laughs> go shopping and be a mom, black mom or Chinese mom or whatever, or Indian yeah. mom with three kids, you know, and you're doing your shopping and how, how are you treated differently than let's say me going in with a bunch of kids and a husband and everything. And it, and it just, it is different, you know, and there is just that inbred response to someone who's different from you. And it isn't necessarily true um, when you're in a country that's homogenous, like, you know, when you're in Japan, everybody has black hair and they walk around and they <laughs> all or look Asian or anyway, years ago when I was in Japan, that's how it was. And then with blonde hair, I was stuck at like a sore thumb. But when you're in our country, we've got so many different types of people, so many ethnicities. Yeah. Well, and I will say I've traveled a lot in Asia and there, there, there's diversity there as well. Um, but it is different. One of the things that I found very helpful to my perspective uh, was travel. Because, for instance, if I, Annie and I were just in the Philippines uh, a couple of years ago, and here I am, a six foot white woman <laughs> in, in, shopping in a, in, a, in a complete, you know, I mean, we were in a local store, a local shopping center. And it's kind of weird because, you know, people are like, you know, wow, who are, who are you? And it's like, wow, I'm not one of the many. I'm yeah. one of the few. And, and, and it's sometimes hard if you're white America, living in white America in your gated community, and you just don't see that happening. That, that I guess, is kind of my point is, is, is that it's very easy to get blocked into where you are. And yeah. it's going to take some actual change some actual work on humans part to actually see somebody else's point of view for instance and i'm you know i in many ways i'm in a really interesting example because i spent 50 years as a tall white male and now i've spent 15 years as a, a tall white female and the differences that i that i experience are in Incredible, and it's not as a male. I there's a zillion things that I want to just. It's not the same. We're not just <laughs> we're not just shorter and have a different shape. There's a, there's like a whole different thing that goes on over here. Now imagine you know, and this is this is. I mean, I'll just kind of take it to you. You you when you have a daughter. I have a daughter. As a father, I would say, you know, here's some things, honey, that you need to do. Here's how the world works. And then Annie, her mom would say, hey, you know, this is, well, you know, dad doesn't really know all the ways of women. So let me tell you about how it really works. And in so many ways, it's, it's a definite blind spot until you actually, you know, walk in somebody else's moccasins. Yeah. <laughs> now, in your life. And tell, as a woman, tell, tell me about how something that you might explain to your son or your husband that's like, you know, honey, it's not like that. I mean, are there, has anything come to mind that, or an experience you've had where, where you've had to say like, yeah, well, I would do that, but you know, I'm a woman, I'm ready to not. Dude. Oh, I think it a lot of, uh, I can think of something right off the bat. And one is having to do with safety, uh, being more concerned about locking doors, um, you know, making sure you're in a safe neighborhood, that type of thing. Um, I think sometimes men have, uh, grown men have a blind spot about maybe how we are careful, more careful about our, our own personal safety just because of rape and attacks and things like that. Well, and uh, let me riff off of that because uh, that was one of my real wide open, oh my God, this is so different. Because I used to tell Annie, I could, I could as a tall white guy, I could go to the Walmart at midnight and I could park 10 blocks sure. away and I just whistle my way over to the thing and walk through the store. I didn't, I didn't even 
it could be in pitch black. Who cares? I mean, I, I can do that. But not only as a woman, but a transgender woman, because there's a little twist in my life, because if I'm recognized as a transgender woman, that, that also has its own extreme danger in many cultures. I was in Virginia when I transitioned, and there's a lot of conservative people there, and Annie worried a lot whether I would come back. And part of what she trained me, you know, explained to me was, is that when you go to Walmart at night, first of all, don't go to Walmart at night. Yes. That's the first thing. But if you're stupid enough to go, park <laughs> under a light, near the door, go in, come out with your keys in your hand, right? In case somebody comes up yeah. on you, at least you have a, something sharp and your keys are ready to go open the door, close the door, lock the door, now somebody can't pull that door away and pull me out. As a guy, I would have never, never had worried about that. No. But, but that's walking in somebody else's shoes. And I think, you know, when you're looking at George Floyd or, or the, the justice system, you're saying, well, no, this is, you know, we have liberty and justice for all. It's like, oh, Maybe well, I, was, I was listening to somebody speak who uh, a gentleman who um, I've been listening to his uh, podcast. He's uh, biracial and he was talking about uh, he, his, his job, his career is placing people in executive positions, affirmative action positions uh, in large corporations. And so he was saying that, yeah, he can place let's say a black gentleman or a black woman in as a CEO who would be very capable on paper of doing the job. But the, the transition is so different because sometimes the, the existing for, uh, sales force or the existing personnel in the company does not really receive them and integrate them. In other words, integrate them into the system very well. And it makes them sort of feel separated at the top. So there's so much integration that needs to happen when you bring somebody in, uh, either a woman CEO or a woman CFO or something like that to run a company and whether people are going to receive them with. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, uh, again, it goes back to your model that you grew up with our, our women respected. I mean, when we have a whole Ozzy and Harriet thing going on and women stay at home and they don't, they're not smart enough really to drive a car and they pretty much can make the bed, but dad, he's smart. He can go to work and, and that carries forward for generations. And there's a lot of paradigms that, that we are grappling with right now. And that, and a lot of that has to do with the systematic the system that was built around a set of assumptions. And, and the thing that's like becoming more visible is, is that the assumptions when they built the system were kind of favoring one group over another. And as, as a transgender woman, you know, one of the things that I, I pointed out last week, uh, thankfully, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, if I were in 20, any one of 26 states, so more than half of America had laws on the book that said that if I came to work as a transgender woman, you could fire me. Legally, happily, it was expected. That was the law. Now, thankfully, the Supreme Court struck down that law last Monday, Yeah, uh, which, is a, which is a step forward because see, there is just in that, in my experience there, there is this, as a transgender woman, I'm an other. I, and there's, there's a certain expectation of what a transgender woman is and how capable we are and, uh, you know, that we have to be segregated out, just like women. You know, uh, my mom was an executive, Annie, that was an officer with me in the military and talk about a difference. You know, here's a woman who... Uh, there were, I think, 5% women in the military uh, when she was an officer. And as an officer, it's kind of like you were saying, you're a leader. And so you walk into a squadron and you say, okay, here's, you know, this is what's going on. This is the mission. And all the guys are like, yeah, like what? Yeah, exactly. Tell the, tell the other colonel to come in here. And, it, you know, it's like, what are we going to, 
It's like, no, listen, I see the rank. The rank says you're going to go and do this. But how you do that, and that's a whole another discussion. As a woman, you can't oh. just come in and be the tough guy. Guys can be the tough guy. But women have to come in with a little bit different way of doing things. And all of that comes from this background. Well, what you're saying there is a whole other subject, which I could talk about for hours and hours, which is as a woman leader in, in business, you, you cannot, uh, we, we, we were trained originally through, you know, the whole women's liberation movement and everything to try to behave like men. Well, I don't think that today we need to do that anymore. And I think that good leadership skills involve incorporating some of the nurturing qualities that women are, are so good at and listening skills and communication skills so that now we can incorporate our, our innate natural way of being as a woman into being a good leader. Yeah. And so it's taken years for women to get off of being, you know, so stringent and more masculine in their approach, like as a newscaster or something like yeah. that. I have to actually be real. I have and, to stop yeah. you there. I, Barbara, I have to stop you there because <laughs> That <laughs> you're right. We got to. I'll have to bring it back again because we're yeah, out of time. Please. We, uh, we can talk. We can talk about that. There's a whole, a whole thing. I'll end this with the idea. Please, everybody, think about being unified. That we are one, and that that there are different experiences out there, and that it's up to you to actually find a way to understand what they're doing. This is Laura Meeks. We're on the Laura Meeks Show. Barbara, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> And we will bring you back again. There's more to talk about. So much. Laura Meek Show. We'll see Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Bye-bye.